So, ladies and gentlemen, with a short delay, we can we could start the sixth symposium European Remembrance in Brussels. Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all at the annual European Remembrance Symposium. Here we are, representatives of various institutions dealing with 20th century history, meeting already for the sixth time to discuss, debate, and sometimes also argue about topics related to building a common European culture of remembrance. Each year, we focus on a different topic. This time, this is a violence throughout the 20th century European history. However, common European remembrance remains a permanent feature of our reflection. Is it needed? Is it possible? And if so, based on what principles and under what conditions? This reflection requires an openness to knowledge and readiness for discussion and cooperation built through an exchange of different narratives and sensitivities. That is why the symposium host have invited guests from a number of Eastern and Western European countries and sometimes even from outside of Europe. Guests who perceive the very same issues from different viewpoints shaped by different experiences. Those of us from Central and Eastern Europe are particularly keen to discuss topics linked to enduring and resisting two totalitarian regimes, Nazism and Communism. At the same time, due to lack of such experiences, subjects like colonialism, often debated in Western Europe, seem almost alien to us. As we all know, one can find many more differences and similarities between our perspectives. It is worth mentioning, though, that open debate concerning such themes can really take place only now that the Central and Eastern Europeans have begun to fill the historiographical blank spots left by communism. And yet, we still need time, patience and openness to learn more about one another and, what may be even more important, to treat that knowledge as an enrichment of our own narratives. This is what the ENRS is all about. The network delivers and coordinates annual symposiums, annual scholarly genealogies of memory conferences, joint research projects, educational projects for young Europeans, as well as exhibitions and publications that disseminate knowledge about the 20th century history of Europe. It also seeks to contribute to developing standards of responsible discussion uh, on the past by devising and propagating guidelines for international discourse on memory and history, which I encourage you to find in your conference materials. With this range of activities, the networks and debate they provide, we acquire a broad and diverse spectrum of visions as wide as possible, conducive to reflection and stimulating dialogue. This, is, this also has its practical dimension, which is of key importance to us and could be summarized by a single word, cooperation. The symposium is intended as a cradle for new ideas, inspiring international projects devoted to history. This is why we have gathered here today, to provide a forum for you to talk to one another and in the near or more remote future, initiate collaboration and deliver joint projects. As we are aware that building such relations takes time and determination. 
the symposium is a long-term project which we all, both us present here today and all the participants of its previous editions are building together. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all aware that honest reflection and on history and memory requires thinking about not only what is beautiful and noble, but also on aspects that are difficult. For instance, violence used as a tool of exercising power with which the world is still struggling and will continue to struggle, and which in the last century reaped a deadly harvest of unpre unprecedented proportions. Violence, which in the 20th century, as Heinrich August Winkler put it, became the synonym for the immeasurable. This is the focus of the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity and our projects, carried out with partners from almost entire Europe. I cordially invite you to join us in that cooperation. And today, I would like to uh, place special emphasis on the role played by the partners and co-organizers of this event and thank the following individuals and institutions. First, the director, Professor Nico Wouters, and Dr. Chantal Castellot, um, Castellot uh, and from the Center for Historical Research and Documentation on War and Society from Brussels. Professor Marek Cichocki uh, and the Natolin European Center Foundation from Warsaw. Professor Peter Haslinger and the Herder Institute for Historical Research on East Central Europe, Institute of the Leibniz Association from Marburg. Dr. Reka Foldvarinekisch, President of the Com Committee of National Remembrance from Budapest. Director, Director Robert Kostro and the Polish History Museum of Warsaw. Professor Matthias Weber and the Federal Institute for Culture and History of the Germans in Eastern Europe from Oldenburg. And last but not least, the Royal Flemish Academy for Science and the Arts hosting us today on its premises. I would like to thank also the Hungarian Embassy and Hungarian Culture Institute which have helped us with organizing today's dinner. Ladies and gentlemen, joint implementation of international projects on history and memory should be seen as an investment in the future, our future, yet primarily that of our children and grandchildren. The goal is to build strong civic communities for our countries, and for Europe, communities conscious of their identities, their heritage, and diverse legacies, Communi communities of free and sensible people. Thank you very much. And now I would like to invite Dr. Reka Foldvarinekis to read the letter to you from Dr. Tibor Navracic, European Commissioner for Education culture, youth, and sport. Since um, Dr. Tibor Narbacic couldn't uh, come here personally, he sent a letter for you and asked me to, to read you and um, uh, transmit you his uh, thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, before a new Europe could arise with the fall of communism in 1989, throughout the 20th century, millions of Europeans were killed, imprisoned, tortured, deported to gulags and concentration camps because of ideological, racial, religious, or other reasons. Millions of people were displaced because the borders had changed, though the will of the citizens was not taken into consideration. 
Countries were occupied, schools closed, national languages and traditions persecuted. Indeed, the scale of the suffering during the last century was so great that it would be hard to find a family or a community which had not been influenced. Neighbors turning against neighbors, states persecuting those who they were supported to, supposed to protect. This is the bitter heritage of the 20th century in Europe, which we cannot escape and which marks identities of many European countries, both in Western and East Central Europe. Initiatives such as the European Remember Symposium allow us to reflect upon, upon the atrocities of the past century and their meaning for contemporary societies while acknowledging national and local sensitivities. By bringing together history scholars and culture managers from Europe, the symposium creates a vital space for dialogue and for the exchange of various perspectives. Only by discussing the distinctive ways in which different European countries remember and commemorate the 20th century history may we gain a better understanding of each other and as a result building a common ground necessary for meaningful and lasting cooperation. This is why networking events such as this one constitute an important part of advancing history and memory studies as they provide an opportunity to go beyond possible current tensions and through dialogue and respect find a fuller historical understanding. While discussing the history, it is crucial to ask questions about the past, not only for academic reasons, but in order to learn from it. The European Network Remembrance and Solidarity is a valuable initiative in this respect because apart from organizing events such as this one, it is known for educating and engaging young Europeans in the dialogue about the past. I do not need to stress how important this contribution is to our common European future. I wish you all a fruitful and inspiring discussion. Best regards, Tibor Navracic. Now I would like to invite Professor Freddy Dumortier, uh, the director of the Royal Flemish Academy of Belgium uh, for Science and Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you at the Palace of the Academies for this sixth European Remembrance Symposium. We are happy and proud that you organize it here. I'm going to give some facts and uh, facts about the palace and, and the academy. Our palace, as you might have seen when entering, is laying between the royal palace on this side and a house on that side that is the uh, official residence of the prime minister of Belgium. It houses five academies, among which the Koninklijke Vlaamse Academie van België voor Wetenschappen en Kunsten, Royal Flemish Academy of Belgium for Science and the Arts, is one. This neoclassical palace was built between 1823 and 1828 for Prince William of Orange, the later Willem II of Orange, at that time crown prince to the former United Kingdom of the Netherlands. It was only in 1876 by a royal decree of the Belgian King Leopold II that the palace was put at the disposal of the Belgian academies. At that time they were not yet split by language, the official language merely being French. The original academy for Sciences was first founded in 1772 by Empress Maria Theresa of Austria. 
It was called Academy Imperial et Royale des Sciences et des Belles Lettres de Bruxelles. It was, however, suspended in 1794 during the French occupation and was founded again by William of Orange, William I, in 1816. We have commemorated this fact last year in November. Now let me present some facts and figures about the KVAB, the Flemish Academy, of which I have the pleasure to serve as permanent secretary. We became an independent academy in 1938, so part of history of the 20th century, almost 79 years ago. For the moment, we have about 300 members, counting ordinary members and honorary members, besides 140 foreign members. Members are nominated and elected by their peers. Most are university professors, former university professors, but we also have influential business leaders, artists, and art experts. Together, we aim at contributing to the promotion of science and art. The academy is divided into four divisions called classes, natural sciences, humanities, arts, and technical sciences. The classes often operate independently and sometimes together. As most academies, we organize public lectures, symposia, concerts, other cultural events. We also award prizes to deserving art scientists and artists, as well as to public figures or organizations doing serious efforts in promoting science or arts. Last year in December, in this room here, we, for instance, awarded the prize to the Dossin Caserne. It's a memorial museum and documentation center on Holocaust and human rights. It is established in Mechelen, next to the former transit camp from which Belgian Jews and Romani were sent to concentration camps during World War II. At that time, the responsible of the camp was also responsible for Fort Braindonk, that you will have the opportunity to visit next Thursday. Fortunately, nowadays, the director is not longer an SS Sturmbahnführer, but is a scientist. We have many working groups, permanent ones and ad hoc ones, to study all kinds of problems. We, for instance, have a quite active committee on historical sciences. We support the Flemish Commission for Scientific Integrity, as well as the Flemish Young Academy. And each year, we organize two so-called thinker programs, for which we invite per program one or two foreign experts to help us in studying important issues in which we involve the major stakeholders in Flanders. For this year, we have chosen multiculturality and the era of transparency. In 2015, one of the programs was the end of post-war, the thinker being Ian, being Ian Buruma, who some of you might know. Another important activity consists in a yearly production of position papers containing recommendations to government, industry, education, and research. The aim at being a valuable addition to the societal debate on a variety of subjects. Let me finish here my short survey of the activities of the Academy since you have a busy schedule to accomplish. The program of your symposium looks very interesting. Unfortunately, having to pre present at other meetings, having to present at other meetings, I will not be able to stay. I wish you a fruitful meeting and a pleasant stay in Brussels. Thank you for your attention. Thank you once more. And now I would like to invite Professor Nico Wouters, uh, head of Chegesoma. Yes, thank you, esteemed uh, colleagues, dear organizers, dear speakers, dear participants. It is for me both a great honor as well as a sincere uh, pleasure 
to stand before you here for a brief formal welcome address to launch uh, this prestigious European conference. As has been said, my name is Nico Wouters. I represent the Belgian Center for War and Society, the Belgian State Institute for Research and Documentation on Wars and 20th Century Conflicts. It is a Brussels-based uh, institute that since last year falls under the authority of uh, the Belgian State Archives. My institute was created in 1967 by the Belgian government, um, at that time specifically to deal with the difficult legacy of the Second World War in Belgium. Compared to many countries in Central and Eastern Europe, the Nazi occupation of Belgium uh, had been relatively free of mass violence, but nevertheless the aftermath of the, the German occupation would leave Belgium a deeply divided country. At the end of the 1960s, the Belgian government thought that the time was right to follow the example of several other countries, such as the Netherlands, France, and the Federal Republic of Germany, to create an official scientific state institute that could document the Second World War, launch systematic historical research, and communicate its subsequent results to the broader public. This last aspect was very important even at that time because at the end of the 1960s, World War II in Belgium was not some thing of the past, but still very much a topic of the political present. In 1997, my institute broadened its scope to the First World War and more general wars and conflicts um, related to Belgium in the 20th century, including also the Cold War period. And these last years, obviously, with the centenary commemorations, a lot of attention has gone, indeed, to the First World War, where my institute has played a modest role in giving a boost to fundamental research on the First World War. And today, as part of the Belgian State Archives, uh, one could say that the third cycle in the life of Sege Soma, my institute, has begun. For Sege Soma, this new phase comes in a context where the political, cultural, and social landscape has obviously changed profoundly since the years of our creation, and even since 1997, a year when, for example, the digital turn was still at some distant corner. The very kind invitation of the European Remembrance uh, and Solidarity Network to participate as the Belgian partner or one of the Belgian partners for this conference here in Brussels came therefore at a very timely moment for us. It enables us to confirm that a combination of fundamental historical research with different forms of public engagement will very much remain our core business. And second also that European partnerships remain essential. This invitation to participate puts us in an ideal position to meet many important actors that are dealing with the same questions and the same challenges that we are. First and foremost, therefore, this conference is an ideal event to strengthen the concrete relationships between different European scholars, European institutes, and other European stakeholders in general that often still operate within a predominantly national context. Building networks, partnerships, and platforms between Western, Southern, Central, Eastern European actors that deal with the difficult historical legacies of wars and dictatorships remains a very good idea and a very good principle in theory, but it's often still quite a challenge to realize this in everyday reality. And this is exactly, I think, why events such as this one are so crucial. During this event, I expect us to meet with each other and take hopefully concrete steps further on that road towards practical forms of cooperation amongst the different European institutes and stakeholders. I therefore applaud the aims and the ambitions of the European um, Remembrance and Solidarity Network. They support some very ambitious objectives indeed, combining on the one hand historical research with memory work on the other hand, academic research and institutional cooperation with broader social debate, and also the focus on different historical themes and, and topics, the legacies of, of Nazism and communism. So the chosen topic for this particular conference reflects this also very well. The topic of violence is perhaps not necessarily the, the most original topic, 
but it is highly relevant and it works really well. Violence is a multi-form phenomenon that takes many shapes and forms, and as an overarching topic for this conference, I'm sure it will serve us very well during the coming days to discover our mutual points of connection. And I think when looking at the program that everybody will agree that the organizers have succeeded in putting together a very diverse program with remarkable richness in internationally renowned speakers. Therefore, to conclude, I want to offer once more my sincere gratitude to uh, the European Remembrance uh, and Solidarity Network, sp certainly specifically also their organizing uh, committee and organizing team. Uh, Professor Rogulski has kindly uh, thanked me also in his opening address. I didn't do that much, uh, to be uh, completely honest. It was mostly uh, the work of the, the, the European network, so I offer them my gratitude for making all of this possible. I myself, as I'm sure uh, are all of you, I'm looking forward to learn a lot during the coming days. So without further ado, I would like to uh, end my small formal welcome um, and get closer to the actual start of the conference, the next speaker and the keynote speakers. And I will simply conclude by wishing you all a very interesting and enriching conference. Thank you very much. And as the last speaker of the opening part of our symposium, I would like to invite Mr. Gilles Pelayo. He is the head of the Europe for Citizens Unit. Mr. Pelayo, please. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, mindful of the fact that I'm the last one to stand between uh, you and the very inter interesting presentations that are about to come, it's my uh, real privilege to welcome you uh, in one of the capitals of uh, Europe, since I represent the, uh, the European Commission and the uh, European institutions here who are the uh, uh, happy sponsors among many um, of this uh, research network at the uh, European uh, level. This is a really an in excellent initiative and uh, we are all already looking forward to uh, your findings. It can feed and indeed inspire uh, future European policies, in particular uh, in the framework of the Europe for Citizens program that I represent, which has, as some of you may know, uh, a remembrance uh, dimension. As, as you might know, within this program, the uh, European Remembrance Action supports uh, initiative aiming to uh, contribute to a better understanding of the European Union, of uh, its uh, history, of its diversity, and also uh, to strengthening the EU values. Uh, in particular, reflecting on the causes of uh, European uh, totalitarian regimes. So the, uh, the discussions of the coming three days are very relevant to, to what we do. The uh, European Network Remembrance and Solidarity, we received a grant from our programs and uh, contributed to its objectives with uh, concrete outcomes, such as, for instance, the, uh, the video published in the framework of the previous projects we supported called uh, In Between. So the, unfortunately, the uh, limited budget that we uh, have available for the remembrance strand uh, of the Europe for Citizens program doesn't allow us to, uh, to support all the good projects that are submitted to us. We have to be very, selected, uh, sele very selective, sorry, but um, this one was among the, the best one and thus, uh, and thus selected. I won't add much to the uh, wise words conveyed uh, already from uh, Commissioner Navracic. I will uh, just underline that uh, uh, by reflecting on uh, uh, European history and uh, the Europe for Citizens program, uh, current issues such as uh, racism and uh, anti-tolerant behavior can be uh, understood with a continental perspective and hopefully uh, better addressed. Uh, it also offers an insight into how European values were shaped, built, and reinforced. At the moment, as you may also know, uh, the European uh, Union is reflecting a, note, a lot about the future 
of the European Union. And indeed, no future of Europe can be foreseen without a deep knowledge of the past and a proper analysis of the present. And this is why uh, initiatives as this symposium are very welcome and uh, represent an important moment of uh, exchange and um, a common understanding of the, the challenges uh, of today at the European uh, level. I wish you all the very best uh, in your activities in the coming uh, two days, and we will really uh, follow attentively uh, the outcomes of this uh, symposium. Thank you very much.